We know that cities are changing with technology. Cities are undergoing uh, a tremendous transformation that we've seen over the past two decades. Technologies are changing dramatically as well. But let's take a step back for a second. Go back to the 90s, the heyday of, uh, of virtual technologies. Many thoughts that because we can talk to each other across the network, from anywhere we are, see each other over video chat, that urban density would just dissolve. Why would we need to live close to each other if we can actually talk and experience each other over, ne over the network? Um, <clears throat> this is a famous quote by George Gilder, where uh, he said that cities are a leftover baggage from the industrial era, that we're headed from the, for the death of cities. And I was 90s, all right? It's hard to predict the future. And we know what happened afterward. Uh, it couldn't have been more different. I'm not going to go through the numbers that most of us here know. But cities are really growing at an unprecedented rate in multiple dimensions. At the same time, technology is going from being more virtual to recombining with our physical space. So a lot of us carry very strong computers in our pockets. These can sample information as we move around, give us back information wherever we are. <clears throat> You can slap one of those on your machine. This is a simple what's called M2M modem, machine-to-machine -machine modem. It will take it online. And it can make one machine connect with another machine, connect with a person that will connect with another machine with another person. This is a prediction that I like to use by Ericsson, who said that by 2020, we'll have 50 billion devices online. So uh, this is an order of magnitude more than we have people. right? So th what, what this means is that these things are not going to go into our pockets anymore. They're going to go into our infrastructure, into our belongings, into our buildings, into our cars. Uh, our environment is becoming increasingly covered with this sort of layer of digital connectivity, which is blending with it in all sorts of ways. And what we do at the Sensible City Lab is explore what might be the impact of this new condition on cities. How can we make them more pleasurable to live in, safer, better responsive to disasters, healthier, um, we do this in partnership with different cities around the world uh, and industry that fund our research. Um, projects at the lab range from design interventions, like developing physical things that we actually put out there in cities, things that embody the idea of using both physical and digital elements when you, when you, when you make something, something physical. Uh, we also do data analysis and data visualization. Some of you might have seen uh, our project in Seattle where we uh, we're following thousands of items of trash, uh, trying to see where they go. We actually put a little sensor on them that tells you where they are anywhere in the world and follow them for several months in an attempt to improve on uh, the waste removal chain in the city. Another project that we did um, uh, with Rome in 2006 looked at um, observing cell phone data, trying to quantify where pedestrians are, and then connecting it with real-time location of buses and trying to create supply and demand better in real time through actually uh, synchronizing the two systems. But what I want to talk about today uh, in detail is uh, more related to uh, the deep analysis of the large quantities of data that accumulate with us today. You know, think about it. If everything begins to tweet around us, talk back to us, we're accumulating vast quantities of data. We can go back and dig deep into them and try to understand something about their relationship between what people do and how we organize ourselves in the physical space. So what I like to use this definition by Eric Schmidt for what big data is. It's a big word recently, but he calls it everything that can't fit on, a, on an Excel spreadsheet. If you want to put some numbers behind this, uh, go back to Cave Manera. Every image we've been documenting all the way through Gutenberg till 2003 all that data together equates to what we produce every two days now. It's five exabytes of data, unprecedented amounts produced every couple of days, and it's growing. Right? So what might be big urban data? How can we dig into this to start to learn about how to improve our cities? So the first project I like to talk about is a partnership we're doing with Ericsson. This is actually the first time it's being showed, so, uh, so it's um, fresh out of the oven if you want. Uh, we're launching this, we call it Signature of Humanity. Um, let's take a quick dive into the data we're looking at, uh, and then I'll talk about it in a bit more detail. You can turn down the volume a bit. So we're working with Ericsson, which was interesting for us because they service 
over 180 countries around the world with uh, equipment and services, and over 40% of mobile uh, traffic passes through their networks. And we log data on multiple scales of time, from very, very short time frames to longer time frames. This is what's called Erlang data. It's bandwidth consumption on each cell phone tower that we looked at. And then you can dive into this data and ask, you know, what are people doing when they're using the network? You can look at file sharing, you see email, you see social networking happening. Now these, the volume, the relative volume of these types of act activities <coughs> change from place to place around the world. For example, here we're comparing the Americas, Africa, the Europe. Now if you think about it as a whole, when you get a picture of what activities are taking in which places and at which time, we have the capacity of starting to understand how different places function and comparing them in order to gain better understanding on how to design them, crucial for policy makers, crucial for service making as we improve on our cities. Now, let's look specifically. Here we're comparing uh, New York, London and Hong Kong. This is ongoing work. I'm going to share with you some of the early stuff we've been looking at. So this is again bandwidth consumption on each cell phone tower. We're taking data for one month around Christmas time. These gray areas represent weekends and these are holidays around Christmas. Okay, so you can see London up there at the top. The usage of communication diminishes quite dramatically around Christmas and also on weekends. Not so much in Hong Kong, which is predictable, I guess. But look at New York. It doesn't really respond much to Christmas at all when it comes to how much communication takes place in the city, which sort of alludes to the idea of the city that never sleeps. Now, go in deeper, we're here looking at the commercial areas, okay? What's been defined by, uh, by the administration as the commercial areas, the city of London, downtown New York, financial district, and parts of the, of the island in Hong Kong. You see the response even more dramatically up there, right? So very little communication uh, is taking place during Christmas and over weekend in London, in the city of London. Same goes in New York, but look at Hong Kong. There's little diminishing. Uh, and the reason is actually not because people work so much over the weekend, but because Hong Kong has such diverse land use and overlapping land use that it turned out that the area we were looking at, actually we captured also what people are doing at home. So this led us to cluster this data. So you can try to pick out different areas that have the same pattern of using telecommunications data. We found that downtown London uses data in a very similar way to middle and lower Manhattan. Right? So you could pick out those commercial activities. These turned out to be Anglo-Saxon-oriented commercial activities. Look out here in Hong Kong, some of that happens, but also a new cluster emerged of commercial activities more directed toward Asia. You see a little bit of that in London as well. So think about this as almost a real-time census using what we can call a digital exhaust that's moving through cell phone networks, pervasive, crossing socioeconomic boundaries, something that we can use to better understand our cities as we develop policies and services for them. Next project I want to talk about is related to the structure of the city. So we took the same type of data but with higher granularity. We looked at millions of phone calls and the distances that people travel between one place and another to understand what areas are attractive to people and at what quantities. You can think about the idea of, you know, the Plum pudding versus the fried egg, which talks about the sort of multi-core city model used often in planning. This would be, of course, polycentric, and this is uh, this is polycentric, and this is monocentric uh, model for cities. Now, take data about calling, and what we did here is increase the, the radius that people could travel every day as they go to different places in the city. This is Boston. This is Singapore. Millions of people logged. Here the radius is 6 miles, 21 miles, and here 42 miles. And what you see is that if you require that people travel 42 miles to get somewhere, suddenly center of Boston clearly is marked. Same goes for downtown Singapore. But if you go and look only at the smaller radius of commuting, you, really those local centers, the local cores of business emerge. And think of this as a way to understand what is the impact of new infrastructure that's being built. Is it diverting traffic from one place to another? Does it, can you help catalyze the growth of certain areas within the city? This is a tool that we're now keeping on developing in multiple geographies based on the same data. Now last, I want to end with something a bit fun. Um, a lot of you have seen this project. 
It's a Copenhagen wheel. This is a project we developed for the mayor of Copenhagen back at the end of 2009. Uh, and aside from giving you an automatic push, uh, we're using a motor and a generator, a set of batteries, some computers. We also put uh, a capacity to install sensors inside. And now citizens are beginning to develop what seems to emerge as the next new and big urban data. So you can put whatever sensor you want in there, channel it via your phone to the cloud, and build applications and visualizations on top of that data. So here's what 12 bike messengers uh, did in Copenhagen. This is over one week, just knocks. Measurements taken from the bottom up by people who are riding through downtown, emerging into these maps. Visuals of air quality on the, on the street level, which is really when you where you want to measure things. I want to end with this. Uh, thanks a lot.